Welcome to worship with East Brentwood Presbyterian Church, a community church in the greater metropolitan area of Nashville, Tennessee. We are a loving, welcoming family of believers in honest conversation with God. We seek to emulate the ministry of Jesus through compassionate service, with stimulating and relevant exploration of God's Word, and by sharing that Word and God's many blessings with our neighbors in Middle Tennessee and around the world. We are honored to share in worship with you today. We have been underway with this series called Wisdom from the Book of James, timely wisdom for our world today. James is that small little book that most people cannot find when they try to turn to the back pages of the New Testament. It's unique with its focus on actions. And in chapter 2, verse 17, James writes that faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. He doesn't mince words. In this uh, sermon series, we're exploring four ways that faith is lived out according to James. The previous episode was on how listening, it, it matters, and today is upon how our actions matter. Together, we're looking at how James is purported to be the brother of James and leader of the early Christian church in Jerusalem, provides practical wisdom for how we follow Jesus today. So let's get underway with this opening prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. Now, the tradition says that James James was the younger brother of Jesus. 
And James is writing this letter uh, to the Jewish believers who are scattered throughout the Mediterranean world. Now, reformer theologian Martin Luther uh, t- had no patience for this little book that is very hard to find in the back of the scriptures. Um, in his preface to the New Testament, Luther called it the straw epistle, right? The straw epistle, which is not a compliment, um, because he said it had no value. He disparaged the book of James because of the verses we are reading today, the verses that remind us that faith must be accompanied by action. Uh, Luther and other Protestant leaders said such thinking was dangerous because it could lead to a theology of works righteousness, the mistaken idea that you can earn God's grace if you just do the right things, if you just sort of show up, which I know that you all are not doing that here this morning. But in later years, many have come to appreciate James for his practical wisdom, and most have come to understand that while we cannot earn our way to God's grace, faithful followers of Jesus need to not only talk about faith, but to do it. And we heard that in the prayer of confession that we said today. Now, I've been gone all week at a a conference to help pastors um, be more effective in working with congregations uh, and uh, systems approach during times of transition and what I would call for us here, time of transformation. I was over at Montreat Conference Center, um, and I was struck by there were probably uh, 60 to 80 of us online and about 40 of us in the room over at the Montreat Conference Center, people from all over the country that were coming. And I got a sense that, and we talked about how these are challenging times, but I walked away from that conference feeling like we are not challenged. These are challenging times, but given where we are with where we are poised to go, that we are not challenged. I left out of here right after the benediction and rolled on in and then returned here yesterday, Saturday afternoon. And what I have to say today is influenced by three things that happened yesterday. Uh, while, uh, and then I sort of put it down into this sort of talked into my smartphone while I was driving from Montreat uh, across 40 through the mountains, uh, through the hills of Tennessee and Rolled in yesterday late afternoon, got up early and said, well, what did I say? And let's see where it goes. But three things happened yesterday. One is I had the most wonderful early, early morning walk in Black Mountain as I went back in the trails with a dear, dear, dear friend. And we talked for about an hour. I would regard him as a brother. And after we went walking, I had uh, just a most wonderful breakfast in Black Mountain uh, at a little restaurant where we joined a couple. It was just serendipitous that we joined them. They had said, we're in town. You want to have breakfast? And so it was a couple. Uh, He is the dean of one of our premier medical schools in the country, and he and his wife were there. And um, we just sat outside and we talked. And he talked about the challenges right now of what it's like to work with medical doctors in this time. He also talked about the visitation that he had with his son after his son had died suddenly. His son was one who had a very traumatized life, but that his son, after his son had died, during a time of prayer, visited him to give the assurance that he was okay. Then I got in the car and I drove up to Hendersonville, North Carolina, if you know where Hendersonville, North Carolina is, where my family is from, and and I sat in the columbarium and looked at the the granite fascia fascia of um, the columbarium where my parents' ashes are interred. And I just sat there before driving back and I, um, I just, I started talking aloud wishing for, you know, a conversation that you may have had those kind of conversations that you hope for. You go to the stone and you just start talking and you want sort of hoping to be surprised by some wisdom or insight or connection to those who are departed. So those three things happened to me. And uh, then I jumped in the car and I drove over here. And, um, and, 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 and so Now, I suspect that you, in light of those three things, are wondering what I'm going to say today. Um, But before I do, let, let us turn first to the Scripture reading for today from the second chapter of James. My brothers and sisters, um, 
do you with your acts of favoritism, here reading in the second chapter of James, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, hey, 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 have a seat here, please. While to the other one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that has promised to those who that was been promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. What good is it then, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is any good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I, by my works, will show you my faith. The word of the Lord. So James had a hard time going to bed that night. He was upset. He was hot at what he had seen at the church service he attended. So he got back to that service and he spent the better part of that evening writing it all down on his legal pad. He was hot. Finally, by writing enough and getting enough out, he drifted off to sleep. Again, what had happened that day is that two people had come in. Um, One of them was wealthy, had this great-looking outfit on, fine jewelry manicured, polished, shaven, the works. And uh, the other person had come in, obviously, uh, hadn't washed in quite a while. And, And what made him mad was the person who was watching the door that everyone there could see what happened when whoever was watching the door that day made a big fuss over the rich person, but then to the poor person said, uh, seats are full, um, so you're going to have to go stand in the back near the door. Uh, James had, he had gone right home, and he had got out his pen, and he wrote this letter of protest, and he was going to send it to the elders. How the people had lost the connection to and participation with what his brother Jesus had taught and showed. How how he missed his brother. The writing settled him. It reminded him of what was important. Maybe it could make a difference to others. And with that, James drifted off to sleep. It was an understatement to say, How shocked James was when his brother Jesus, the resurrected Christ, appeared to him in the dream. Brother, Jesus said, I I get it why you are so angry, but you need to take your own words to heart. Be slow to speak, slow to anger. James couldn't believe what was happening. Brother, is that you? Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I needed to spend some time with you. It's not well with your soul. Hmm. That'd make a great song someday. 
I know when I was going around teaching, I said to the folks that if people weren't ready to leave family behind, love me more than father, mother, wife, child, brothers, sisters, even more than your own life, they weren't ready to be one of my followers. I know I had said that. I know that when I was alive, I was always being swept by, away by the crowd. They were always pressing in. They were always wanting something. It was so lonely, brother. I miss getting enough time with you. Right now, it sounds like, James, you could use a visit. Jesus continued, what are you teaching? And why are you making it so strong? James said, I was only taking what you said to the next logical conclusion. You had said the people are equal in God's sight, Jesus. You think that everybody already knows that. You taught them that there aren't any special privileges or prerogatives in God's eyes and that there is an inherent God-given, God-blessed equality about us. And in all things and all places, you ought to be able to see it in church where God's people assemble to worship and learn and sing and eat together. You, you had taught that religion, true religion, has more to do with what you, how you live your life than what you say about what you believe. Or even the religious rituals you perform. You reminded them of the prophets of Israel, brother. Who kept insisting that what God really wants is not a lot of bloody, smoking animal carcasses. But justice in the marketplace and kindness in society. And mercy and compassion between neighbors and families. And after the resurrection and just before you went away, you took us to that hillside and you said to us. There'll come a time when people ask you to feed you, to feed us, and you were hungry and you didn't do it. They were naked and you didn't clothe them. You said that, Jesus, and then you disappeared. I'm just taking it to the next logical conclusion. You're right, brother. I know oftentimes there's a lot of talk about Empathy. We ought to show empathy. But then they look the other way and they keep on. If somebody's in prison getting beat on next to you, you can't just show empathy. Compassion is what we're looking at. Compassion is empathy with action. And I get it, brother. And brother, you're right. You really don't believe something until it shapes and forms what you think and what you do and how you live. You got that right, James. Yeah, I got it. But the logical conclusion is to give our lives and our actions because your gift of grace has been cheapened. It's cheap grace. With them saying that they believe and they go through the motions and rituals of belief and worship, but do not translate it into your act of grace and in actions of mercy and justice and love towards others. They want religion, but on their terms, and they, nobody wants to pay full price for anything. Brother, I pay full price. James, did you miss what my offering was? That I came here not only to teach and to give life, but that they would experience grace. Mistakes would be made. There are going to be some of these people that are going to come centuries later. And they're going to believe that true religion is about getting it right intellectually. Knowing the gospel. Understand what we believe. Study it. They're going to produce these creeds. They're going to spend committee after committee meeting and come up with creeds, actions, about what's really important. And then they're not going to do it. Brother, that's common. They're going to think and they're going to discuss and they'll argue and they think they've done the work. They're coming. And keep in mind, though, also that centuries from now, there are going to be people who also 
They may not be out there on the street corners preaching or feeding the hungry, but they have this immense and unique spiritual hunger. And they will want in the church. And, 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 and brother, they're going to find in your words something that's going to speak to their yearning that will help them cope with all of the demands that are placed on them from every direction. It seems there will be people who will be facing work and relationships and family, and they're going to need something that at the end of the day to know that they're not alone. And that in her life and that in his life and that in their being there on this earth, it's going to amount to something. And they're going to yearn for something to do that will give them a sense of purpose and authenticity and maybe a little joy at the end of the day because that's what true religion is. It is a matter of man, mind and heart and hands and behavior. Life lived well. Jesus said to James in his dream, brother, brother, I can see what you're saying. And it is the logical conclusion. Through my suffering and death, I paid the full price, and I offered mercy and grace and forgiveness. And you are right to call people to action. You listen when I said my parting words. Actions matter. Doing matters. But it will never measure up equal to what I offered because human nature is what it is. You keep doing what you're doing. James, you keep writing. And you keep preaching that faith without actions is empty. But remember, the measure of one's work will never match the measure of my grace. James stirred from sleep. He looked around and only saw an empty room. He lit the candle and he sat there wondering what just happened what had been said and it felt like it wasn't out there anymore but he was such a part of reality that his words his life all of our lives and all of time are inside of God's great story of grace and action and redemption James got up and he walked over to where the letter was on his desk. He looked at what he had written earlier in the evening. And he inserted, listen more, be slow to speak, slow to anger. And then he looked at what he had written that night. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, eat your fill, yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself that has no works is dead. He nodded to what he had written. He fell back asleep. It's Labor Day weekend. Time when we're supposed to rest from our labors. We're in the backside of a study of our strategic plan that makes mission the fulcrum of who we are and that our congregational vitality is tied to our being God's hands and hearts in the world hungry, united in hope, we are feeding mind, body, souls. In these days, I am convinced the way to share the good news of Jesus Christ is to lead with our actions. That's why the aphorism says, actions speak louder than words. Don't just have faith. Do faith. Words are important, but the words will come later. Let us start with the action. 
Dear God, in this time of Labor Day, we pray with thanks for what may seem ordinary, mundane and typical, but is really quite something, that there's work to do, that there are workers, and that fair wages can come for our workers. We are mindful that their actions matter, not just for how it may benefit us as we go to a restaurant or we receive a package at the door, but we thank you for those who do more than enough. They go the extra mile and they create beauty and functionality in the most unadorned objects of everyday usage. So many things would not be accomplished without your grace and your provision of intelligence and energy imbued in people giving to uh, lives of work. And forgive us for taking their efforts and the work of others for granted and sometimes devaluing the importance of the task before, before us. So ignite our imagination with the work that we have to do and enlarge our perspective. Give us compassion for those who do not have jobs and respect for those who do. And let our children hear us lift up the stories of a carpenter who lived long ago as a hero and as a savior that calls them to work and to do, not just believe. Amen. Thank you for joining East Brentwood Presbyterian Church today for music, hope, word, and prayer. To learn more about the life and ministry of EBPC, our commitment to being a Matthew 25 congregation, or to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit us at our website, ebpctn.org, or visit us on Facebook at East Brentwood PC, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. EBPC videos. Uh-huh.